Uh, and I'd like to talk with you about uh, medical management of thyroid disease. There are some themes that you will notice will keep coming up in today's talks. And one of those themes is customization. So not everyone's disease is the same. And to have just a cookbook answer to everyone's question generally doesn't work. And it doesn't lead to satisfied patients or satisfied doctors. Um, and uh, the second uh, theme that you'll see over and over again is that supportive care is truly a really, really important part of the management of thyroid eye disease and truly the mainstay of it. Fortunately, a lot of patients never need decompression surgery, but a lot of patients do need supportive care for management of the dry eye and a lot of the discomfort that comes along with this condition. So we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about that. So, um, as Dr. Gupta mentioned, you know, for the majority of patients, the signs of thyroid eye disease, if they're going to develop thyroid eye disease, show up within a year and a half of the diagnosis of the endocrine problem. So oftentimes, patients will come to our clinic, and we take a history, like Dr. Gupta mentioned, and we'll say, when did this all begin? And they'll say, well, a few years ago, I started having, my heart was racing, and I didn't know why, and I felt tired, and I may have lost some weight, and I went to the doctor, and they discovered that my thyroid was high, but there was no change at all in the appearance of the face, and that came on several years later. So that type of story is very common. Um, but it is, as Dr. Gupta again said, it is unpredictable. Just because it happened for one person at 18 months doesn't mean it'll happen that way for everyone, and it can be many years. Um, the disease is usually progressive once, the, once it manifests, and so there is that ramping up active phase during which you can have proptosis, meaning your eye moving forward, double vision, discomfort, redness, and all of those symptoms, and then ultimately they start subsiding, but they seldom make it all the way back to how things were before the whole process began. So this curve you've seen multiple times today, we call it Rundle's curve. On the y-axis we have severity, and on the x-axis we have time. This is typical for the course of thyroid eye disease. You start off with nothing, you ramp up to a very active phase with a lot of inflammation, you settle down to somewhere in the middle. And then depending where you land on this edge, you may need surgery, you may not, you may need some medicines, you may not. And that calculation of what you're going to need is different for each individual. So one of the things that we need to do when we meet you for the first time is really stage the disease. And this gets at one of the questions that was asked earlier. Staging of the disease is not something we can do generally in one visit. And it involves quite a large number of data points. So you'll notice, and as may, many of you already have, that your first visit for a thyroid eye disease workup is a marathon visit. You're going to have visual field tests. You're going to have photos taken. You may have an ultrasound done you're going to have a ridiculous number of eye exams done that you've probably never heard of, including color vision testing and all this crazy stuff. Well, the reason is because we want to understand as much as we can to draw up what we consider just your base profile for that first visit. Then we have all of those data points to follow in time, and we can figure out from there whether you're really getting better or whether you're still getting worse. Depending on where you are in terms of your inflammatory phase, there are some non-surgical interventions that we can do to help you to feel better and to try to stave off vision loss. And so what are those? So the most important is actually supportive therapy for dry eyes and exposure. You know, the movement of the eyes forward is very common in this condition, and the opening of the lids is very common in this condition. What people talk about a little bit less frequently, because I think it doesn't directly impact what you look like, is that along with the movement of your eye and along with the opening of your lids, you also have a decrease in the amount of tears that you produce. And so it's a double whammy. So not only is your eye more out there to dry out more easily, but then your ability to create tears to then wet it again has also diminished. And so you're getting dry from multiple, prompt, multiple angles. And so supportive therapy for that is a very, very important thing to do. One of the things that I like to do to help families understand what patients are going through in the clinic is say, try to look at me for about 30 or 45 seconds without blinking. And see how atrocious that feels, how awful that is. This is how patients feel all the time. And so I, that's one way you can really get people to just get a glimpse of what it's like to have a dry eye problem. And so a lot of the emotional problems that Dr. Kahana was talking about, this is not a magic bullet, it's not going to fix that, but it sure as heck would make you feel better if your eyes aren't drying out and feeling like you have sand in them all the time. Steroids are a very, very old, very powerful medication that we use to suppress the immune system. And so, in theory, that sounds like a very nice thing to do. 
this is an autoimmune problem. If you have a medication that can then depress your immune system, then presumably it should help the inflammation and make you feel better. Well, the issue is that this is like taking a sip, but from a fire hose instead of a water fountain. So there's all sorts of side effects that come along with steroids, and so therefore we have to use them very judiciously. They can have side effects that can even be life-threatening. And so, yes, this is a powerful tool, but like many powerful things, you also have to use it very carefully. Radiotherapy is a type of treatment that has been in vogue and out of vogue throughout the decades for treatment of thyroid eye disease. Radiation, like it, when it's used for cancer, for instance, it does the same thing when we use it for thyroid eye disease. What it does is it basically diminishes the ability of tissue to grow and regenerate, and it destroys tissue. So naturally, you can imagine how that could also have some pretty serious side effects. There are some patients who will be good candidates for this, and there are some patients who won't. And this is, again, where that theme of customization comes up. There are other modalities that are currently being developed for thyroid eye disease that are trying to take the approach of a steroid. So you want to basically affect your immune system, but instead of just nuking it and just blanketly just depressing the whole thing, we want to do it in a more targeted way. And so we'll spend a little bit of time talking about what those medicines look like, what's out there, and that might be something that you want to discuss with your individual provider. So um, here at Kellogg, typically, we have some combination of this type of treatment for patients. Oftentimes, there's some sort of telephone interview, either with a technician or a clerk, to understand what it is that your particular symptoms are. So not everyone comes in with double vision. Not everyone comes in with a subjective decrease in vision. And depending on what you tell us, when you call us, we'll set up a customized visit for you. That's why some people get ultrasounds and some people don't. Some people get special types of visual fields and some people don't. So this is where we start. <coughs> then we review your medical records. Many of you come to us with lots and lots of medical records. Believe it or not, we look at them. <laughs> we want to know. We want to know what's been done because that can help us get an idea of progression. Um, the visit schedule, again, is customized based on these. Your clinical exam is very long. And then we come up with a treatment plan at the end of it. So um, artificial tears are an over-the-counter formulation of basically water and salt that is meant to mimic the wetting properties of your own tears. This is used all the time for all sorts of reasons. There are people who have other autoimmune conditions who develop dry eye. Um, we know that in graves, a lack of tear production is a huge problem. And so I pretty much offer this to every single patient that comes in with a grave disease into my clinic. Because even if they're not having gritty sensation all of the time, it doesn't take much to push them over the edge. You go outside and it's windy, suddenly your eyes feel like you have sand in them. You like to golf, perhaps. You like to golf and you try to golf, but then you feel like your eyes are hurting. They then begin to tear all over the place and you can't see your ball. <laughs> so there's all sorts of manifestations of this, and many of them can be certainly mitigated by just making sure that your eyes are well lubricated. Gels and ointments are basically a more intense version of artificial tears. You're basically choosing to have a more viscous formulation so that it lasts longer and does a better job of moistening your eye. But the way that you're paying for that is because this can blur your vision a little bit. You know, it's, it's an ointment, it's a goo. It's oily, it feels not so pleasant sometimes. But sometimes we have to do it, and oftentimes we'll recommend these for people at night. You're asleep anyway, you don't need to have clear vision when you're sleeping, and it's a wonderful way to help your cornea remain healthy. Um, punctal plugging and punctal, punctal cautery is yet another step. We'll go over some diagrams that explain what this means. So we can do some manipulations of your own tear drainage system so that we can basically try to hijack it and make your own tears hang out a little bit longer on the surface of your eye. And um, there are some prescription medications that can be placed as eye drops that are topical immunosuppressants. Again, this, this theme of immunosuppression keeps coming up. Sometimes you may have heard of topical cyclosporin because there's all sorts of commercials for it, for restasis. This is something that people use for dry eye, whether they do or don't have graves eye disease. And uh, some people have found this to be quite helpful, some people haven't. You know, it is a very strong medication, and when you place it in the eye, it tends to burn. If it burns people who don't have graves disease, imagine what it does to people who do. And so some people consider this to be worth it, and they just love the effect, and some people say, get away from me, I don't want them anywhere near my eye. <laughs> and this is, again, customization. You know, communication between the provider <coughs> and the patient becomes so crucial, because there are some medications we may consider to be just absolutely wonderful, but it interferes with your life in a way that you never want to use it. It's important for us to know that. Um, the other item that we have available here at Kellogg Center 
um, which is not available everywhere, but we're lucky to have an optometrist who fits these, is scleral lenses. These are a special type of contact lens that basically hold a water bath right up to your eye. Depending on where your lids are and depending on what type of vision you have, some people are great candidates for this and some people are not. But there are some people for whom this makes all the difference in the world. So this is what a moisture chamber looks like. This is uh, a pair of glasses with uh, basically a plastic casing that comes around so that people can do a little bit better when they go into windy situations. Sometimes, depending on a person's profession, they may require something like this in order to be able to continue to work. So if you know that you're spending a lot of time outside, if you're working in a wood shop, if you have particulates flying all over the place, this may be a wonderful thing. You may not want to wear it all the time. It's a bit of a fashion statement. But, you know, it may be very helpful for you. Uh, you know, the, uh, the tear drainage system, we were talking about this before. No, this is an eye. Each eye has two tear drains on the inner corner, on the upper lid and the lower lid. You can actually place a little silicone plug so that the tears that are bathing the surface don't go away as quickly. So this is a temporary closure of a tear drain, or you can actually cauterize that tear drain so that it's closed forever. Um, there are reasons why we recommend one or the other to different people, uh, but this is certainly a conversation that we can have. Placing a plug is something we can do literally in one minute in the clinic. It does not involve even getting a numbing shot. It's actually, we do it just with a numbing drop. And uh, it tends to work very well for people in terms of making not only their own tears more efficient, but also the drops that they put in. It helps them to hang around longer, and they do a better job. Um, so uh, this is what a scleral lens looks like. So I bet you've never seen a contact lens that big before. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's, it looks kind of barbaric, um, but uh, these are actually custom fit to the person's eye. And so wearing them is actually surprisingly comfortable. Uh, but it is a process. It takes custom fittings. It involves many visits to us. But there are some people who, for whom this is just a really, really, really beneficial tool. And so this is a conversation that you need to have with your surgeon. Say, listen, I'm having really horrible dry eyes. Is this something that maybe could work for me? You know, and there are reasons why some people are good candidates and reasons why some are not. And we can go over that with you in specifics, you know, in your clinic visit. So, um, Again, we have this Rundle curve. And so we talked a little bit about radiation, and radiation is a little bit controversial. And so where in this activity phase would radiation fit? Um, you know, usually it's here, when things are really, really hot. Um, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, it's something we seldom see anymore. Very, very few people get radiation because we have better things that we can offer these days. But let's say that a person is absolutely unable to take steroids because they have so many other medical conditions. They're just very sick. And so the idea of being on a steroid is very life-threatening for them. And we may, we may be backed into a corner and just not have much that we can offer. In fact, sometimes people are so sick that we can't take them to surgery right away, even if we wanted to. And so we have to do something. And so in these people, sometimes we'll offer exonobium radiation in this very, very hot, active phase. Um, the idea is that we can probably not make it go away, but we can try to diminish just how severe things get. And so the idea of intervening in this active phase is to basically make the curve a little flatter. Does that make sense? Okay. And so anything that's kind of anti-inflammatory, that would be the area where we would be using it. And so what are anti-inflammatory options? You know, we talked about steroids. Steroids come in, a, in several varieties. You can take them orally and go home with some pills. You can take them IV, so we can send you upstairs to our periop area and they can hook you up to an IV and give you some medicine. Or you can inject them directly into the eye socket. Um, there are pros and cons to any of those different modalities. Uh, radiation, we've touched on briefly. Selenium is an over-the-counter dietary supplement that has had some time in the news. Some people have really loved it. Some people think it's worthless, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. Um, and then cytotoxic agents, um, there's some uh, new science in the world of autoimmune disease that where we're trying to use some drugs that are used for other autoimmune conditions or even cancer conditions and apply them into Graves' eye disease with some level of success. So a little more about steroids. Oral, intravenous, local injection. So what are the pros and cons? So we'll talk about orals first. Orals are great because you can take them at home. They're cheap, so you can get them easily from your pharmacy or you can even have them mailed to your house. And they are effective. They work. A steroid, again, it's a big gun. It's going to suppress your immune system. That's what it does, and it'll do it well. However, the side effect profile for orals are, is the absolute worst. What are the side effects that you can get? It can make your sugar go haywire. It can make you be sleepless at night. 
sometimes it even induces psychosis where people just change their personality. This can alter, if you use it for a very long time, the fat distribution in your body. People get a very, very wide base. It changes what you look like in that way. Um, and usually they have to be taken for a long duration in order for them to get the effect on the Graves' eye disease. So for that reason, there are some people who are great candidates for this, and there are some people who are horrible candidates for this. Intravenous. What are the pros of intravenous? Well, it's a shorter duration of therapy. Usually you don't have to take that nearly as long. You can even do just one pulse of steroids so that you're done with your medicine. Um, there's a question of whether it's more efficacious if you just put it directly into your IV system, into your intravenous system, rather than taking it by mouth. Um, there's, that's a little bit controversial. But it certainly does have a better side effect profile. Again, you don't have to be on it forever and ever. You just get the one instance of it. So your chances of developing sugar problems, restlessness at night, um, having the fat distribution issues is much lower. Um, the cons for intravenous steroids are access. You can't do this at home. You have to come in, and you have to be here for a while, and they have to monitor you afterwards to make sure you're not having a bad side effect, and you have to get poked because it's an IV. So there's that. Um, local injections, uh, this actually avoids the majority of the systemic side effects because you're putting it directly into the area that is having the inflammation. However, you can have local ophthalmic side effects. Having a bunch of steroids right next to your eyeball can make your eye pressure go up. And so sometimes people develop glaucoma. <coughs> sometimes having a large dose of steroids injected anywhere can make some of the fatty tissue atrophy or die away. And so there are, not to mention the fact that you're getting a needle in your eye socket. I mean, that's bad. <laughs> so, so, you know, but that notwithstanding, you know, these are not trivial side effects. Do these happen frequently? No, they don't. But this is a risk to benefit ratio that you have to really understand before you choose to go with one of these treatments. And your surgeon will likely have an idea of what he or she thinks is best for you, and you can discuss it at length, okay? So, um, radiotherapy, I won't spend a lot of time on this because, honestly, this is really, we see it now as, as more of a last resort. Um, and so, um, <clears throat> this is just basically what people look like when they're actively inflamed. You know, we've gone over this, and you'll go over it a few more times. This is somebody who's fairly mild. Early on, but you can see her eyelids are more open, and she probably doesn't have too much proptosis, but she certainly has a lot of redness, and she's feeling the act, the signs of inflammation, the symptoms of inflammation. Um, it is this type of patient for whom selenium has been purported to have some nice benefits. So if you already have your eyes bulging, if you're already losing vision, if you already have double vision, then the horse is out of the barn, and selenium is not going to do anything. But it's these people who are in this very mild category that supplementing their diet with selenium has shown some benefit in some populations. I always tell my patients, they ask me, is this really going to help me? And I tell them, 50-50, it may or it may not. Because I really don't know. And I've had as many people say this is worthless as, as have said this is fantastic. So um, there's a New England Journal of Medicine study that was published on this, and they showed some quality of life improvement and some mild improvement in the soft tissue findings, meaning that redness and all of that, maybe a little bit of improvement there. Um, it's subtle at best. The bottom line is that it appears reasonably safe. In high doses, selenium can, it has been shown to precipitate the onset of diabetes, but in the doses that are used for Graves' eye disease, it's not. The truth is this is a naturally occurring element. It's in all of our diets. We live in a selenium-rich part of the world, so we all have it in there anyway, and it seems to be reasonably safe, but it's unclear if this is really particularly effective. Um, and so we, you know, we talked about some people being too sick to have certain types of treatments. So what if you can't have any of these? What if you can't have radiation? You can't have steroids, and you can't have selenium? Well, luckily, we have some newer things that we can offer. Um, I won't belabor the point with this diagram too much, but this is supposed to be a blood vessel up here. These things are supposed to be B cells. Those little guys that are stars are supposed to be these harmful antibodies that then interact with your eye tissues or joint tissues and then cause problems. So basically, this is an issue with the immune system. So there are ways that we can then block those little antibodies so that they never make it to the target tissue and therefore don't egg on the inflammation. So this is where we can kind of introduce anti-B cell or anti-T cell targeted therapy to directly affect just a portion of the immune system rather than just blanketly just dousing the whole thing. Um, this 
we won't belabor the point too much again, but again, there's a whole cascade of maturation of these B cells, and we can choose where we want to intervene. And it so happens that this drug we're going to be talking about knocks down all of these B cells right here, which were the ones that produce those bad antibodies. Um, this is a, a, a medicine called rituximab, which does the B cell depletion, or B cell, um, I'm sorry, a blockade. And so this is a person who had active signs prior to rituximab, and this is how she looked after rituximab. Now, if you'll notice, she has more lid retraction. She has some strabismus, her eye is a little bit deviated, but the inflammatory signs are gone. So it's by no means a magic bullet, but it can help the inflammation get better. Um, and then what's new on the horizon, Dr. Douglas, who's sitting right back there, is actually uh, leading the charge with a new type of antibody that we're testing for this disease, which blocks another inflammatory um, agent in the inflammatory cascade. So again, same concept, you want to take a little portion of the immune system and knock it out rather than knocking out the whole thing. That's the idea. And this is called the IGFR1 receptor um, antibody study. And uh, you know, in short, what we want to do is basically ad adopt therapies from other autoimmune entities or develop therapies based on our knowledge of the autoimmune process and try to get the inflammation in graves to settle down without grossly affecting the immune function elsewhere in your body. 